Everybody obviously calls me and says, like, do you see Dave on SNL? And I'm like, yes, we're very good friends. I always watch and send nice texts. Well, he normalized anti-Semitism with the monologue. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I don't know if you've been on comment sections on most news articles, but uh, it's pretty <laughs> normal. I learned that there are two words in the English language that you should never say together in sequence. And those words are the and juice. <laughs> I've never heard someone do good after they said that. Man, I'll tell you what, I walked away from all that money back when. Dave, Comedy Central and all that I, I went to I went to Africa for like five years. Yeah, I think you just chickened out. I think you got overwhelmed with the work and you just couldn't hack it. Man, why does it gotta be about chicken? That's racist. So did you see SNL? Did you see Dave Chappelle, his monologue? I I, I did not, yeah. but I listen, let me just say this. I, I'm a Dave Chappelle fan. I have a really strict line on racism, sexism, homophobic, things like that. It's just wrong. Uh, it's nothing to joke about. It's a very serious subject. You know, Don, it's crazy. I'm almost 60 years old, and I grew up in Alabama, you know, and obviously I know about Montgomery, Selma, Birmingham, things like that. To still be having racial conversations 60 years later, and we're debating whether people have the right to say it and joke about it, it's, it's really, it, makes, it just makes me sad. Yeah. Uh, it, makes me, it makes me mad. But it really just makes me sad that 60 years later, we're still saying having racial conversations 60 years later. And almost, a, look, almost a de- well, more than a decade ago, I do have to say, and then I'll let you guys jump in here because I don't want to hog this conversation. One of the first people to contact me after I came out was this man mm. right here. And that was over a decade ago. So these issues are really important to you, and you always stand up for people's individual rights. Well, you know, Don, first of all, I, one thing that always has disturbed me as a black person, which really bothers me about the Kyrie Irving situation and the Kanye West situation, first of all, being black in America is already hard enough. And for us to go at other ethnic groups just makes things worse because it's hard enough being black. And one thing has always disappointed me, black people treat gay people, we are the worst when it comes to treating gay people. And that's one thing growing up, it really always bothers me. And I want to reach out to you and all my gay friends, all my transgender friends, and tell you, man, I got nothing but love and respect for you. I want you to be you. And I wanted you to know that that day, because I understand being black, what it's like being gay, because you get mistreated, and it's really unfortunate and sad and stupid, to be honest with you. I grew up around Jewish people. I have a lot of Jewish friends. So I'm not freaked out by your culture. I know a little bit about it just from hanging around. I'd be like, yo, yo, let's go out at school tomorrow. They'd be like, we can't go out. It's sha na na tomorrow. I'd be like, where? <laughs> what is sha na na? I had so many questions. Why do some of your people dress like Run DMC? <laughs> people think Jews control Hollywood. People think Jews control the banks, and to pretend that they don't, and to not deal with it in a straightforward manner, we will never gain any kind of understanding with each other. I saw one news pundit screaming about Kanye. She said, mental health is no excuse for that type of language. Yes, it is, bitch. (laughs) You kill somebody if you're mentally ill. Listen, okay, I don't think Kanye is crazy at all. I think He's possibly not well. Well, I've been to Hollywood. No one's y'all to get mad at me. I'm just telling you, I've been to Hollywood. This was just what I saw. It's a lot of juice. Like a lot. <laughs> but that didn't mean anything. You know what I mean? There's a lot of black people in Ferguson, Missouri. Doesn't mean we run the place. (laughs) And the whole point of all this is to not let it metastasize and to get it out in the air and talk about it. Like, like I know you don't like Jews. I see it in your eyes.
Dave Chappelle monologue just at the piece on Trump because it was pretty powerful. And it was a good reminder of what a formidable candidate he was. And let's face it, is likely to remain. Watch this. The declaring the end of the Trump era. Now, OK, I can see how in New York you might believe this is the end of his era. I'm, I'm just being honest with you. I live in Ohio amongst the poor whites. <laughs> A lot of you don't understand why Trump was so popular, but I, I get it, because I hear it every day. He's very loved. And the reason he's loved is because people in Ohio have never seen somebody like him. He's what I call an honest liar. That first debate, that first debate, I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen a white male billionaire screaming at the top of his lungs. This whole system is rigged, he said. And the moderator said, well, Mr. Trump, if in fact the system is rigged, as you suggest, what would be your evidence? You remember what he said, bro? He said, I know the system is rigged because I use it. I said, God damn. <laughs> And then Hillary Clinton tried to punch him in the taxes. She said, this man doesn't pay his taxes. He shot right back. That makes me smart. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, if you want me to pay my taxes, then change the tax code. But I know you won't because your friends and your donors enjoy the same tax breaks that I do. And with that, my friends... A star was born. No one had ever seen somebody come from inside of that house, outside and tell all the commoners, we are doing everything that you think we are doing. <laughs> inside of that house. <laughs> they just went right back in the house and started playing the game again. <laughs> so good. Oh, he's absolutely so good inside right. that on. You remember what he said with Rand Paul? That was what changed a lot of people's votes. Rand Paul, who was a... I, I've grown in admiration for him, especially about the lockdowns. And he said, uh, well, the Donald Trump represents the toxic brand of politics quid pro quo. And he went on and he made it some legitimate criticism. Trump didn't even blink. He said, yeah, ex absolutely. You came into my office. You wanted $10,000. I wrote you a check and you've been subservient and you've done whatever I wanted since. And I thought <laughs> <laughs> that was just amazing to hear somebody say that. And it kind of blew Rand Paul off the stage. But uh, it's not wise to wrestle with Donald Trump because he's actually been in a wrestling ring himself and he doesn't care. And a lot of people thought, I mean, if you look at the people like an Anthony Fauci or even a Howard Stern or the Clinton group, anybody who thought they were going to go mano to mano with Donald Trump and just trash him, trash him, trash him. They didn't end up as well as they thought they would. And the other thing that's ironic and it's also tragic, Megan, is that we have this group of candidates and Trump is just baying at the moon that they all owe him. So it is true that he really helped DeSantis win uh, in 2018. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Yeah, he really did. And uh, it was a very close race. Mike Pompeo will probably run, but we wouldn't have known of Mike Pompeo unless Trump had appointed him CIA director and state as secretary of state. He really empowered Nikki Haley by putting her in the national scene as UN ambassador, where she was very good and she got a lot of good airplay. And he endorsed Ted Cruz and made up with him. So he that that's what's sad about. It. And Mike Pence, I don't think Mike Pence had a career left uh, until Donald Trump uh, selected him vice president. So in a way that makes it even more tragic that all these people are going to run against him. He's going to scream and yell that he had a hand in giving them prominence. And they're going to say, yes, you did, but I don't owe you forever, given your behavior or the what, what you've said. I can't condone that. And so it's just the whole thing is tragic because uh, he, he, we all know what he has to do and he knows what he has to do and he can't. Mm. He, um, and by the way, uh, Rand Paul, He's going to be on the show tomorrow. <laughs> so I, one of the I, I really that's sad admire about Rand Paul now. I mean, he just he's another person that <laughs> after what Trump did to him like that, and rather than just get irate and he kind of ended his presidential campaign, he began to see that Donald Trump had some ideas and policies that were similar to his own. And and he was very pragmatic. And what he did with those uh, COVID hearings, I thought, were was 
absolutely necessary. And we he's all owe the him reason we know. He's the reason we know half of what we know about Dr. Fauci. He just wouldn't Absolutely. let it go. And he, as a doctor, saw it early on and, and the, the lies, the dishonesty, the misleading. Um, yeah, we that's a separate issue, but and we he, definitely he's know a, him. He's on a frame. When the whole Pelosi thing happened, it was, you know, everybody was sending their thanks. And maybe it was on tour, but he reminded everybody that Pelosi's own daughter, when he was seriously injured with lung damage and uh, broken ribs and pneumonia, she had said, seems like your neighbor was right. She was celebrating that. In the darkness of the night, a flicker starts to glow. A beacon in the shadows, a light that starts to flow. Illuminating pathways where once there was despair. In the depths of obscurity, hope begins to flare. Like a flame in the wind, I ignite from within. Casting rays of brilliance, banishing the din. With each step I take, I brighten up the way. In the realm of shadows, I become the day. I'm the light in the darkness, the spark in the night. Guiding lost souls towards the morning light. Through the tunnels of uncertainty, I'll be the guide. For I am the bearer of hope in me, dreams reside. In the labyrinth of life, where shadows dance and play. I'm the ray of sunshine, turning night into day. With every glimmer I cast, I unveil the unseen. In the tapestry of existence, I'm the golden sheen. From the darkest corners, to the highest peak. I'm the radiant glow that even shadows seek. With every flicker, every beam I emit. I dispel the darkness, I never submit. I'm the light in the darkness, the spark in the night. Guiding lost souls towards the morning light. Through the tunnels of uncertainty, I'll be the guide. For I am the bearer of hope in me, dreams reside. In the symphony of life, I'm the crescendo's rise. In the canvas of the universe, I paint the skies. So let the darkness tremble, let the shadows flee. For in the heart of radiance, I'll always be. I'm the light in the darkness, the spark in the night. Guiding lost souls towards the morning light. And she used her not her married name, but the Pelosi name to give that message resonance. And Nancy Pelosi didn't say a word. And that of was course. terrible for her to do that. And he brought that up and everybody said, oh, my God, he can't at this moment. Yeah, he can do that to remind everybody that it's a two way street. And once you break the rules then you can't expect everybody to take you seriously as an enforcer. That's of the right. That's exactly right. And by the way, most people were not saying it didn't happen or that Paul Pelosi deserved it. I didn't see any person no, of promise saying that, that. There were just questions about the story being released by the police.